and hello and I'm back with Joshua Shgala who is now uh, who is an early Bitcoiner as you've learned in a previous podcast and right now is working on a very exciting project and that's uh, what we're gonna mainly talk about in this podcast hello Josh hey good to be back <laughs> good to have you back so how did you get from Bitcoin in 2010 11 into the 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 standard dot io the project that you are involved with today so, so i got into bitcoin um i lost a lot of money in the mount gox collapse um uh like a, a more than anyone wants to imagine and oh my and god then, in bitcoin did you have a bitcoin on yeah. mount gox yeah 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 after that what i realized is that this this industry needs transparency Mm -hmm. So my brother and I sat down and started to think about how to build it. Actually, we first wanted to build a decentralized exchange. So we started researching how to build a decentralized exchange. And this was before Ethereum existed. So the trouble with Bitcoin is that its, it's coding language is too small to, um, it, it's, it's too thin to actually develop a decentralized exchange you can okay. use what's called a side chain, but um, but it, that wasn't really a thing yet. And we we yeah we just we thought instead let's focus on transparency of the blockchain. So we developed a, a transparency protocol called the Glassbooks protocol. Now um, we shopped that around. Uh, this allowed exchanges to be ultimately transparent, and it was very easy to use. It was what we called grandma friendly. And so we, we shopped this around and no exchanges wanted to take it. No exchanges were interested in being transparent. So we thought, okay, we see what's going on here. Um, let's build our own exchange. So we built an exchange called Voltoro.com. What we focused on is instead of fiat, instead of trading against fiat, because we all got into Bitcoin to get away from fiat, but everyone was pricing Bitcoin in US dollars. Everyone was obsessed with getting more US dollars. And, and I was like, let's price it in gold. Let's have a rare assets. Let's have a rare metal versus rare numbers. Okay. So, so people could trade in an order book against gold sitting in a Zurich uh, high security Swiss vaulting facility um, that was fully insured, fully audited. So no bank account can do that. You you cannot audit a bank um, because they, they're they rehypothecated, meaning they've lent out money here and there and everywhere. And they're very, very, you know, intransparent. Mm -hmm. And no bank is insured to how much you've got. So this, in Europe, you're insured to what, like 100K in America, it's 250K through the through the uh, government insurance program. But uh, gold in a voting facility can be insured of how much stuff you've got because it's a it's a good, it's a physical good. So yeah. we uh, we built Voltoro to basically allow people to, um, to trade that. And the other thing back then was, as soon as you took money out of an exchange, the bank went, hey, where's this coming from and froze your account. And so many people that even were taking out a couple of grand here and there would have their bank accounts frozen. So um, going into gold and, and it was purely legitimate, like they weren't, but because of all the bad headlines about Bitcoin, mm -hmm. um, even though most people were using it to buy bed sheets on overstock.com and stuff um, back then, it, it was, um, it was still had a bad press. So, so banks would just shut the account because it was too much risk for them. You know, and um, and so yeah, trading into gold would allow people to um, not have to worry about that because you weren't never touching a bank. So if you felt Bitcoin was really high, you could trade into a physical gold, and then Bitcoin would collapse down. You could trade back to Bitcoin, um, or you could take physical delivery of the gold. So this is, and it's still going now. You can go over to Voltoro.com and, and still do that. But um, but yeah, so we did that and we we implemented the Glassbooks protocol, which allowed anybody to audit the, the exchange in real time and see how much liabilities the exchange has got and how much should be uh, on in cold storage. So it was a it was a really so nice system. Was it like a decentralized proof of reserve? Something like that? It, it, it wasn't. Um, how it worked was that everybody got um, a, an anonymous ID. So when you logged into your, your Voltoro.com account, uh -huh. you would get an anonymous ID and only you and us as the exchange would know what that ID is. Now, you could share that if you wanted to give it to your accountant or something, but 
Only you and, and us knew it. Now, what you would do then is you would log out of the system. So we don't know that you're checking. We don't know when anybody's checking. And we publish every anonymous ID with how much Bitcoin they've got mm -hmm. and how much gold. And and so you could look up your anonymous ID and go, oh yeah, there, that's me. That's And, and we yeah. wouldn't know you're checking. So we can't fiddle with those numbers. And we would publish then the cold wallet addresses, how much is in the cold wallet. And we had like a warm wallet address, which was uh, a different topic. But anyway, you could you could verify how much Bitcoin is sitting with us mm -hmm. and, and you could sum up everybody's holdings and go, oh, look, it's it's equal to or, or less than the amount that's sitting in cold, cold and warm storage. Um, so you could just, you know, and, and if we fiddle with your number, we don't know that you're checking. So we can never really, someone would have screamed and shouted online if we started changing the numbers uh, in people's different accounts, right? So that that was just a very simple way of doing it. And for the gold, we we published the gold vaulting facility certificates, the um, the auditors certificates, um, the statements from the gold, how much how much gold is sitting in there, and such like that. So, so that was the transparency protocol. Um, other exchanges nowadays they use the Gregory Maxwell Peter Todd security protocol, which is uh, which is a little bit more technical, and uh, it uses what's called Merkle tree proofs. But what I didn't like mm -hmm. about it was that it just, you just ran this software and it would give you a green tick, go, yeah, tick, yep, it's all good. Yeah. But no one could really like, how do you verify, like, how do you understand what's, how does grandma understand what's going on? And with our system, grandma could look at the thing, find, find her, uh, you know, anonymous ID and, uh, and actually verify, oh yeah, that's how much I've got. You know, I understand, and I can sum up everybody's holdings and and equal it to what's in the cold and, and warm wallet. So it, it was, um, yeah. I mean, and there's better ways to go. And even that nowadays, after after the FTX debacle, no, I don't yeah. think that's even enough um, because liabilities are so hard to see. Because I can I can let's say I run an exchange and I then have everyone's deposits. I can prove through the transparency stuff that um, that people are using, like like that's on Kraken, like that's on Binance right now, and go look, it's all there. But I don't know as a user has CZ taken that deposit and made a a, a written contract with someone to use it as collateral for something exactly. to borrow. It. Exactly how much liabilities does the Binance have? You know, me being an early Bitcoin, I, I get asked to to give talks at a lot of different conferences and such. And one of my favorite conferences is called La Bitconf uh, in La okay. the Latin American Bitcoin conference. And I got asked to give a talk there about stable coins. And so I'm I'm busy running Voltoro. I was on the plane and I was reading Terra Luna's white paper, who had just oh, been yeah. released. And and I thought this is a nightmare because me coming from an economics background of I like to back things, either uh -huh. it's a rare number that cannot be printed out of nowhere. And that's what was the aha moment with Bitcoin. Wow, there's only 21 million of these. This is amazing to or a gold standard where you have a bunch of gold and you back you you, you back the currency with that gold. Mm -hmm. That makes sense to me. And and. When these algorithmic stable coins came out, and Terra Luna mm -hmm. was was the very wasn't the first. There was BitShares from Dan Larimer, and and a bunch of other things. Well, there is one very popular, and the one that even I still like. It's called Dai, right? It's based. It's paired with the Maker, and yes. it's on Ethereum. So, what do you think about that one? Dai is amazing, and and actually yeah, the standard because Dai is not an algorithmic stablecoin. It is backed ah. by people's. Uh, it, it is an asset-backed stablecoin. Oh yeah. So I can quickly talk over the three types of stablecoins if you'd like. But I just just quickly, quickly finish off this thought thread. Mm -hmm. So I went I went to La Bitconf and gave a big warning talk about algorithmic stablecoins and wow. said one of these is going to get really really big, and then it's going to collapse, <laughs> and then the government is going to come in and regulate the hell out of this space. So we have to be first. We have to stop using these and warn people to stop stop using you know um that was me and and uh neville from from reserve i came back and thought i've got to start thinking about developing 
a proper stablecoin solution because these clowns are going to wreck it for everybody, <laughs> just like Mt. Gox is going to wreck it, uh, wreck the name of Bitcoin. And uh, and so we started working on the standard IO. But so the okay. standard IO is a is a stablecoin protocol, and it's a it's a it's a um, an asset backed stablecoin protocol. So let's just quickly go through the different stablecoins. Uh, running an exchange since two thousand and fifteen, we we pay a lot of um, of freelancers. And in twenty twenty, around twenty twenty, you know, um, even a little bit earlier, people started invoicing us more and more in Tether. And it, and I I would ask them why are you doing that? And every time it would come back, well, when I when I invoice, I want uh, it, it becomes very, very difficult to account for. If I if I send my invoice to my accountant and mm-hmm. the accountant has to decipher between what the price of Bitcoin was at the time of the trade, if there's any capital gains tax, if, you know, there's all this stuff, uh, depending on the jurisdiction, that makes it a nightmare. If you invoice someone in USD uh, T, um, uh, that's t- Tether, 100 mm-hmm. tether and you get 100 dollars worth of tether then that's that's an easy it just blanks out and it's like yeah. okay that's you know it's really useful so and it still has the amazing programmatic ability of of bitcoin you can program it you can do amazing stuff you can send it to smart contracts you know all this all this cool stuff so so the trouble with central so that's the first type of stablecoin is a centralized stablecoin what is that it's if i if i have a bank account and i put one dollar in the bank account and issue an erc20 token on the ethereum network and say every time dave you you have this token you can come back to me and get the one dollar in my bank account and you're like okay that's great that's a great idea it's a very simple idea but you know where that idea comes from it comes from the original way that money actually started gold is like five thousand years uh, of gold as money and silver so it's you know it's gone through lots of iterations but when it really exploded was um it, in terms of the west was obviously out of europe <coughs> with um uh the the well the, the rothschilds uh families voting facilities they they were big in um in in this and there was lots of um uh, lots of bank banking families and that became so wealthy because eventually they thought not everyone's going to come at the same time and collect their gold and silver yeah so, I mean, they don't have to have everything back there yes yeah, it doesn't so, need to be that much precious gold lying around like doing nothing of course like it's just too yeah, tempting it's, just, it's always too it, tempting that's right and, people and, are you always know, so easy for, First, people are too easily corrupted. So first of all, they would say, okay, I, we've got all this gold. Do you mind if we lend it? Do you mind if we can lend it to people? And people say, oh, yeah, um, lend it out, uh, whatever. And But eventually they realized not everyone's going to come back. So I'm, we're just going to lend out bits of paper. It's just going to here write bits of receipts and charge interest. So these people were getting paid, um, getting getting charged interest for something that wasn't even in the in the vaults they were just writing receipts now these bankers got so wealthy that that you know it was it was ridiculous kings and queens didn't li- live like these people uh they they were so so wealthy and and then you had massive revolutions when you started to have huge economic crises and you know the french started cutting off heads and and um and the bank said well let let let's continue let us continue this this deal that we've got let us continue doing what we're doing and we'll give you a cut and that's where interest comes from so and then you can start earning interest yeah okay we'll give you money you're allowed to be in fractional reserve mm-hmm. uh, meaning you've got a fraction of the reserve than the than the debts that you've got going up so that's the original scam and now we've got banking which has zero reserve so there's like people don't even the banks don't even need any reserve like in some banks some countries it varies from country to country but a lot of them they don't need any now what what the problem with tether or these centralized stable coins is they're doing exactly the same thing as those early things we've gone full circle and say okay instead of depositing your gold deposit your fiat which is also printed out of nowhere mm-hmm. <laughs> and we will issue a receipt um you know that 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 we feel is that and you can always come and get it now they go hmm, not everyone's going to come and get it at the same time and, and you have the same problem 
So, and not only that, there's there's massive problems. Like banks are speculating with the underlying asset. Uh, people mm-hmm. are speculating on the crypto market with the with the receipts, meaning the tethers. There's a whole lot of stuff that can go wrong with that system. The standard.io is an alternative, right? Is, yeah. Yeah. So the a... second one is the algorithmic stable coins. Okay. And and that is backed by nothing. Basically, it's backed by a bunch of math. It's it's actually backed by usually their their governance tokens. This mechanism obviously will fail, and uh, because it it can have the illusion of working in a bull market, and then as soon as there's a bear market, uh, it uh, all the all the house of cards crumbles. So, um, what we're building at the standard.io is a mechanism where you have a provable, truly transparent way of backing uh a stable coin with rare assets so similar to MakerDAO, okay. that allows you to send a uh, crypto into a smart contract mm-hmm. and borrow against that yes uh, by minting new stable coins you do the same with the standard except maker as wonderful it is is it became it was first and it made a lot of mistakes and i feel that what well what we're doing is is basically a next generation of that there's certain things that really are awful about maker one of the things is in a bear market people mm-hmm. that have locked up assets get liquidated so i, I just want to step back a bit because the collateral that they that they use goes down in value so they have That's to either right. deposit more collateral or well or they're gonna get or or withdraw they can actually return put back the die that they borrowed right and then they exactly yeah. exactly so so if you have a box of stuff take this box of chocolates here this is your vault okay it's, and you you Moot. put you put uh you put some crypto in let's say ten thousand dollars worth of crypto because you want to buy a car for eight uh-huh. thousand uh, or five thousand So you put $10,000 worth of Ethereum in here and you can lock it with your private key. Now you still have that private key. You're the only one with a private key. It's wonderful, not your key. Because it's decentralized, because it's in the system. It's not in a centralized server. Yeah, Mm -hmm. you have a smart contract. You can lock up some some assets and print up to 85% of that in terms of the standard as as a standard Euro coin. So the, the, the difference there is now you have standard euro you can go and buy your car and hey guess what ethereum is going up in price you're happy um uh or um and not only that with the standard it's all zero percent interest so there's no stability fee there's no interest rate so you're borrowing money from yourself and um zero percent interest so effectively inflation is paying off your debt because because when you when you um as as we have more and more inflation now money becomes worth less and less so it becomes cheaper to pay off your debt which is amazing okay wait a second i have a couple of questions uh really quickly so there is a tst token uh which is the governance and membership token for the protocol of the, the standard.io our team is just busy building the technology to make these smart vaults and the the governance token while it's actually what you can do right now if you do want to partake in it is where uh, where we ran the initial bonding curve offering it's called and this is how we're building the the stability pool and what that is is basically allowing people to buy the very first s euro at a discount and so you can come in you add liquidity to this pool and and you get the first s euro at 80 cents to to one s euro so you um you know, it is a speculation. You you think, you hope. I I know in my <laughs> my because I'm working on it so hard, is that it'll it'll reach one euro eventually. So you basically get the get twenty percent gain pretty instantly uh, because you can buy you can put um, some Ethereum into a smart contract and get um, more euro worth than you're getting. <laughs> Okay, okay, but can you withdraw? Let's say, but today the price is 0.91 euro uh, for one for one token. Can I withdraw it? Like when the price got one cent higher, like tomorrow, can I withdraw it one cent yeah. higher? Or can I? Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah. Won't I mean, it then decrease the price if everybody withdraws or half of the people withdraws? 
what happens, the more liquidity that comes in, the less that discount becomes. So as, as the volume uh, of the stability pool, because the whole point is to have a bunch of uh, stability in this, a bunch of liquidity in this pool. And why, why is that? Because this pool will always buy back at $1, at one euro, sorry. Um, so people can send an S euro in and, uh, sorry, Ethereum, uh, sorry, an S euro in and get one S euro, one euro worth of Ethereum out eventually. But right now it's sitting at 85 cents or 89 cents or something like that. And the more liquidity comes in, the more that that reaches one to one. And then we'll have that pool. Then the next step is we release the smart vaults, which is similar to maker vaults. And those maker vaults uh, will allow for really some really cool ideas. Um, so these are called standard smart vaults. And what will you be able to do is lock up funds and issue new S euro. But the okay. cool thing is if you've got those funds locked and you're in a bear market, um, some of the new things that we're bringing to the table is to say that you can swap the collateral that's locked into a different coin. Mm -hmm. So you can swap it not only to, let's say Ethereum's dropping like crazy, you can swap it over to something else, um, but keep it as collateral. You can't actually withdraw the collateral. So this stable coin that you can get is backed by your crypto assets. Is there also yes. any other way that you can back it buy like can you back it by commodities or something like that or... that's right yeah so so one of the things we're building the reason why you can trade because there's no real point if ethereum's tanking you're pretty sure that bitcoin's also tanking right mm -hmm. so there's no point um trading your collateral from ethereum over to bitcoin because you'll probably still get margin called uh, yeah. for your loan so what do you do well you trade it to a tokenized gold so um, Voltoro is issuing gold, tokenized gold versions eventually. We'll also have Pax Gold. We'll also, we're going to onboard a whole bunch of decentralized uh, authorities around the world issuing gold tokens. So, so you can trade into a tokenized gold so that you can, um, you know, hedge the volatility and not get liquidated. Okay, but isn't it in the, in the most catastrophic cis, uh, uh, scenario, Will the co-tokenized gold even remain the to the gold pack? Because in the most catastrophic scenario, like only the the physical proof will matter. Like this is what the DAO token allows. Um, the 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 DAO will vote on which gold tokenized gold tokens there is. So we want to make sure that people can take those tokens and actually go pick up the physical. Now it's That's... not a perfect world. It's not a perfect world. You know, we, we're just trying to get close. If we just mm -hmm. went for perfect. We, we'd never get anywhere. So this is just a way of saying we don't it's need a journey. banks. Yeah, it's a journey. And we don't need banks to deal with this stuff. We can we can be, you know, the good thing about gold is it's a private thing. These private voting facilities are amazing. So it's outside of the banking system. Now, the second thing what we can do is let's say you've borrowed, um, you know, $5,000 from yourself. You've got $10,000 uh, or euros worth of assets locked up in these smart vaults and you've lost your job you cannot pay it back. The, the market's sinking and you're thinking, oh, I just want to get some liquidity out of that because, I, you know, I, I can't afford to pay it back and it's going to get liquidated. So what you can actually do is sell that um, that collateralized debt position as an NFT with the standard. Someone will buy this debt off of me. And so that's another way um, that people will be able to recover funds if they if they can't afford to pay off their debt or add more collateral to it or um, you know something like that or even if they don't want to trade it to a tokenized gold. So these are these are two mechanisms that I think are really really interesting. Um, and imagine you know in two thousand eight, Dave, when these CD because the two thousand and eight financial crisis happened because banks were issuing collateralized debt positions similar to maker vaults. <laughs> so mm -hmm. banks would lock up debt in terms of mortgages mm -hmm. into these CDPs, which was collateralized debt positions, and they would sell them just like uh, just like what I'm talking about with with NFTs, but they would sell them as contracts. Um, first, they would get them a rating agency to come in and go, oh, yeah, that's good. It's rated A++. Yes, but the rating agency it was corrupt. It was not A++, yep. and they were also... In the the packages, the market the mortgage packages also contained very risky market mortgages. Risky yes. meaning people that were had their first job, people that had already three other mortgages, and they were yep. very unlikely to be able to pay the mortgage 
fully back ever, but it was still included in the packages that were rated A++. Exactly, exactly. And now imagine if that whole thing was run through NFTs with collateralized debt positions that were truly transparent. Now you could just run some software and see exactly what's what's running through all of those collateralized debt positions that you're holding and know that they're actually um, uh, got the collateral in them. You don't need a rating agencies that's corruptible. You don't mm -hmm. need uh, intransparent contracts. Uh, you can actually do everything through smart contracts. So the standard IO is focused really on building a truly decentralized stablecoin protocol. And it's not only euros. We'll be releasing SUSD, S yen, S shekel, S ruble, S Australian dollars, S, you know, all of them. So we will have a stable coin pegged to every major fiat and people borrowing against those fiats. And 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 the the um the governance token holders get a cut uh for, for a little bit of work that they do they get a cut um, of all the the fees that get paid throughout the system so it's a it's a it's a really nice network we've thought a lot very strongly about it it needs to be governed by a decentralized mechanism mm -hmm. and DAOs are such a wonderful mechanism DAOs blew me away just how much bitcoin blew me away and we haven't yet seen the full power of these things um, and I think they're going to be absolutely extraordinary. So our time is unfortunately running out. We have like uh, five more minutes. So in a, in a nutshell, to summarize what the standard.io is, uh, I think you are the right guy to do that. So I'm not going to do that for you. So if you just say in a nutshell, like in a couple of lines, what it is. Yeah, we're up against something really, really major in the financial markets that's going to come, which is the central bank issued digital currencies. Um, these are ex CBDCs. These are extremely dangerous instruments for freedom. The freedom that you and I have inherited through through our, by, from our forefathers and our parents and our grandparents and our great grand, these people have handed down to us this world where we have the freedom to transact and it'll it'll be guised in convenience it'll be disguised as a super convenient mechanism but it's total control over every cent you spend where why how and mm -hmm. and we've been through two years of this pandemic we see how close governments got to wanting to control every part of your life um so if they have the technology to do so they will the standard io is its main focus is to give people of the world um, an alternative monetary system that is stable has all the virtues of bitcoin and and ethereum uh, uh, in terms of programmable money but is stable and allows people to borrow money from themselves at zero percent interest uh, while letting inflation pay off their debt i'm really pouring my heart and soul into this project uh, along with a, a a big team based all around the world um, because we do feel it's very, very important to beat CBDCs to the game and and build a network effect. And it'll be projects like us, like MakerDAO, um, uh, that, that will bring true stability um, to this crypto market, to the blockchain market. But we're really hoping to have, um, you know, a blockchain FX market with, uh, with uh, hundreds of different coins uh, in terms of peg to fiats uh, that can trade. So a blockchain mirror of the effects market and that's really uh what what is next in the in, in the scheme of things so uh it was a wonderful story it was great to talk to you actually both times and i have that feeling that this was not the last time <laughs> so uh well, so reach out anytime you know and, so uh, and i'll come back all the best to 2023 to you and to the project the standard.io uh, uh, it's uh, also, I think, not the last time I talk about it on my channel as well. So um, uh, it was delightful to have you. Thank you very much. It's, it's been wonderful to be here, David. Thank you for having me. And uh, I presumably talk to you again. Yes, that's a good presumption. Peace. <laughs>